today we'll first we continue the slides from last week, week nine. You still have the slides open. Let's continue saying from the multi-object optimization. So we spent some time introducing MOO last week. So we first start, continue from there, because we need to finish the second part, the stochastic programming. And then this is a, a content we will cover for the quiz next week. After the stochastic programming, we will move to kind of a, a new area. It's, it's no longer like we, we focus on the analytic or kind of numeric methods. We will use a lot of heuristic methods. So those are regarded as a general artificial intelligence already. When we hear the word AI, we were wondering what are we really talking about? What's the general meaning of AI? But later on, we will show you some of the algorithms as kind of inspired by nature, by the heuristic approaches. So those ways can be part of the AI methods. And from then on, we will continue to introduce the basic concepts of machine learning, machine intelligence, deep learning, to get a sense from here, more basic entry level AI. So you will be able to know if you have interest, you can further explore more online resources we can share with you later. Okay, so we uh, discussed some questions about the solutions of multi object optimization last week, right? So some uh, students have concern about oh, what, what is really a, a, a Pareto curve. So we again use kind of this boundary of the feasible and infeasible solutions to define the series of options. So along these options, they are all the results of MOO. One might be better than the other one in one dimension, but worse in the other dimension. So that's kind of the rationale how do we decide the Pareto. So this is a series of solutions. And one important thing I, I see that very confusing comes is when you compare this card and this card, let's say which is the big which, why is this one still here? So that means it, <laughs> we have a judgment condition that for all the objectives, it needs to reach the requirements. So for all the objectives, here is both the safety and the cost. And if you have 10 objectives, it will be very complex. Normally, I just analyze like two or three, but it means for all the objectives, it's no better solution than it in all the dimensions. That's how we can regard this as a big power to optimal as well. Although it's, this one is equally good in one dimension, it's dominated in another dimension. So this is a, a weak power to optimum. Well, they, this, this one is a strict power to optimum. This is how we decide the power to curve and get the optimal solutions along with that. Right, so that's what we find the power to optimal solutions. And we introduce you some methods, the weighted sum. You can tune the weighting factors, either decide one side of the weighting parameters and get one single objective to solve it, or you can do iteratively changing the W weight weights. So you can get a series of the optimal Pareto curve. So that's a solving strategies. And for the epsilon constraint method, it's also a way to repeat with different value of this epsilon m. It's not just you set one to get the solution. You need to put the other constraints, put the other objectives in the constraint, leave one in the objective, and then choose epsilon m and repeat with different values of epsilon m along plot size will give you from you capture each iteration, get the results plotted, and it will give you the, the, the front of these optimal solutions. Okay. So the goal programming we don't require you to know the details, it's quite complex. But the basic idea is like you you hear instead of introducing only one objective. You now have a side of S and B. So you want to you need to decide which is your object, which is your goal. So you need to have a goal here, and then in the meanwhile minimize your distance towards the goal. You want to get closer to your goal. So this is a fundamental thing about this goal programming. 
But when you sew, that it's not easy to sew MOO, even in software. So the MATLAB has two boxes. You can define several of your objectives and sew it. It's kind of already designed the interface for you. So you just input what you need F1, F2. But when we write the MO in GAMS, we, we sometimes need to write some iteration, like you need to iterate your epsilon, or you need to combine different ways. So the most convenient approach when you want to solve your problem is better you, you from the modeling. It's my personal opinion for modeling. You can then decide what's your relative importance, decide your W weights. If, if a weight is larger, it means this objective is more important or less important. A larger w, a larger weight, more important, right? So remember that. That's normally we, we, we nowadays we form a large large scale uh, planning optimization problem. So it sometimes has W one multiplied by cows plus W two multiplied by CO two emissions. Because now the plant when they operate it, it's not just on, focusing on the on the cows terms. They will have show the social responsibility to care about the environment. So this additional environment cost, it can be turned, like CO2 can be PG, equilibrium of CO2 emissions, but it can be then turned to the equivalent carbon price to some monetary value, and then get there. But you may say, oh, I, I, I still care more about the economic cost. I want to uh, use W2 to be like relatively smaller, to multiply, I want to care about it, but not that significantly equivalent to my economic objective. Then you can use kind of this W2 to multiply your second objective of emissions to be the kind of the ways to, to weight your, your environment account. So you can regard W2 as kind of unique price multiplied by the emissions, or you can just give it a weight to see how important it is when you multiply this in the objective. So this is kind of the multi criteria decision making because we, we need to have those all the criteria in consideration. Once we got the MOO solutions, we also need to choose what's the best way, best solution to pick. All right, so that's a, a multi objective optimization part, and then we move to the stochastic programming. As we see, stochastic it's it's a very big branch under optimization because it's a lot. Uh, uncertainties in the real world. The real world is corresponding to stochastic is deterministic. So far we have all say, if we define the parameter, if the cause is two, then it is two. We assume this is the truth. So we call it deterministic. But in most time, this, this cause are those kind of demands, those, those parameters or variables will not be at a fixed level. It's always those up and down. So those uncertainties will cause a lot of kind of different dimensions for us to consider. So stochastic programming in this background is wait, how do we conduct the optimization under uncertainty? So that's more closer to the real world. This is more relevantly used in, in the real world applications, but it's very complex because you then have to consider additional dimensions. So we don't want to get a rough modeling about the overall picture to do something you, uh, deterministic. We'll just give you a basic, we'll give you some solutions. But if you want to do some online optimization or some of the really apply this to a stochastic environment, you need to consider uncertainties. I said, but what are uncertainties? <laughs> I think this 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 word may be unfamiliar, but if by God you can think about in the environments in your work life, what what are uncertainties? So here we just gave you two large category kind of about what are two general different classification of uncertainty. Right, we think about the whole spectrum of uncertainties. There's something of there, kind of default. So we, we call it the arbitrary. So this is kind of a new word, but if you think about those uncertainties, they're there 
that can never be known perfectly. So those are the uncertainties that exist because of the statistical rules, because it must exist, just like the, the, the world has those uncertainties. So in, in many of the natural phenomena, it happens, or if you see the uh, kind of the physical world, a lot of physical rules or a lot of things we want to decide, the kind of a state, it always has a, a you, even linking to a quantum phase, it's a lot of uncertainties in the real physical world. So these are the things that you know they are there, naturally there, to be the statistical uncertainties. Right, so these uncertainties can be some, some cases, some examples here. What is the demand of the product next month? What is the price of the crude oil? And or we will draw a dash, what, what is the number you will get? So those are the uncertainties that can never be known perfectly, we call it. So we have to make some estimation of it. You need to estimate those uncertainties, and they are not constant. Constants here just means they are not constantly the same. So you have to estimate what to do some forecast of those uncertainties. Right, but it's another category, we also call it epistemic. So for the first half, so these are the two new words, but don't, don't need to remember that. Just, just know that the first half is kind of you cannot reduce, in, irreducible, it's, it's always there. But for the second half, it's kind of similar to kind of the systematic error. It's not a, uh, some uncertainties that you you could know, you could have known those uncertainties, but limited to the system or limited to some of the state of the art technologies, you cannot know it perfectly. So those uncertainties are there. They can be reduced in basic technology evolves. If, if technology evolves, you will never know the role of a dance, right? Even if we, we are super talented, we, are, we have super computer, we still cannot know the role of a dance, what it will be. But if we have the super good technologies, we will be able to reduce those system uncertainties. So those systematic uncertainties are here. You don't have to remember though, just to introduce, give you a sense why we have to deal with uncertainties, because our world is uncertain. Right, so a, lot, a lot of the different kind of noise to the system, so we have to model those uncertainties. So if we measure some, uh, or we decide that we do some kind of engineering experiment, we want to know the reaction rate, the mass transfer coefficient, those are the parameters, but still they, they may have some deviation from the true value. So those are also systematic uncertainties here we have to face. And the way we Regard a lot of things as a choose, right? The gravitation, acceleration, it's this G number. We, we, we learn, oh, we always assume it's 9.8. But when we use it, you still know it is not a perfect number. It's still some, when they, they send it do a lot of experiments to say I got more precise number of things. So it's systematic uncertainty exists there in, in the physical systems. So if we really want to model those, it can also be described. But in the stochastic programming, we, I think <coughs> these kind of uncertainties are more commonly modeled because they are really significant uncertainties. We have to model that to describe those different scenarios or different numbers, different state of the uh, conditions. Right, so just following the the concept of uncertainties, if we want to model it in mathematics, what, what the uncertainties are like. They give you some typical examples. So this uncertainties, we, when we put that in the optimization, they normally put in the parameter, like if you see the demand for next day, or the, uh, the some examples we gave here, the price of crude oil next year. So those fluctuation levels, we typically model them as the parameters. Parameters means we, we can't give them a value. 
right? But it's no longer one single value. These are the parameters which are no longer constants, but following some distribution. So no longer one single constant. Now I won't say all oh, your next year will be one hundred dollars per barrel. It will just be the kind of I say it may follow this normal distribution. It's most probably to be one hundred. Well, it still has some possibility to be below that value or, or larger than that value. So the normal distribution is what we, we see a lot, right? Normal distribution is widely used to describe many, many uncertainties in this kind of the, because it's most commonly seen type of the uncertainty of the distribution. But you can also have all different kinds. Sometimes when we uh, predict different parameters, like some uh, for wind energy, it's normally following some uh, different, we can, not the perfect normal distribution, but it may be skewed. So for normal distribution, we, we see the perfect SMH, asymmetric. Right. But for the many of the non the real world distribution, it may be skewed with a tail on some side. So you learn in the statistics, these are relevant to what you learned in the statistics course, right? You have the you could have the normal one, or you could have the different skewed one. Uh, for even for normal one, you will have all different epsilon value to have different types, different shapes of distribution. So this links back to your statistical knowledge, how do you model your uncertainties? You can make a reasonable assumption. So in like sometimes when we study the wind energy availability, this this speed is more important. Then we, we from the historical data of measurement, they got the conclusion that this kind of follows some Weibo distribution, which is kind of with some long tail on one hand side and the normal distribution on the other hand side. So those kind of the distribution is more likely from the data, from your understanding of the process, from historical data, or from the, uh, your forecast. So those uncertainty need to be modeled in this way. Instead of one value, they, they better to get kind of distribution. Right, you can so what is the x and what is the y axis in those cases? This is a simple question, but for we just we are used to those shapes. But what what are those shapes mean? What are the y axis? Probability, Probability right? Or, or the y value. The y are the probability. So for the distribution, x are the values. But y here indicates the probability. So what does this mean? What's, what's a uniform distribution? Right, so it's, you see, it's distributed with equal probability. You can say next day this this demand can be of can be of one hundred or two hundred. They are equal probability, but most time the demand follow a normal distribution. It has the we'll do the normal distribution that has a lot of nice features you can use to to describe this distribution. Or the user defined, you can say based on the historical data you directly draw a curve about probability versus the real real value. And then this discrete probability is also more powerful when you only have several options. You don't have you don't want to continuously know what's the distribution. You only have several options and each option is associated with some probability. So this will be a commonly used case later on when we study the scenario based stochastic programming. You don't really consider, oh, it's, it's more complex distribution. You just define several discrete scenarios. So for each scenario, it's associated with a certain possibility of probability. And then you can get the solutions. So key concept here 
as they say the expected value. So how, how do we calculate the expected value? Or we can also count mean value from the distribution. Right, so this expected value will be based on this distribution. For each value multiplied by your probability. And if it's discrete, you can use sum. If it's continuous, you should use integral. But this will be your expected value from such distribution. These are the basic statistics concepts in statistics, but it gives you a very important concept. Now, when we talk about the stochastic, it brings back a lot of the knowledge you learn in statistics. Right? You should know that the expected value, also the mean, will kind of be the, the very important number you will use in your stochastic programming formulation. Right? So it's a long word here, but the key thing here it's still, we won't give you some definition. So stochastic programming is still a mathematic programming, but it's now affiliated with a stochastic elements presented in the data. So it can be any of the programming, whether it's before, linear, integer, nonlinear, mixed integer, can be any. It doesn't limit to one type of programming, but it must have some stochastic elements Right, so before it corresponds to stochastic, we call it deterministic. So in deterministic mathematical programming, the data or, or the coefficients or parameters, those are known numbers. So we know if I give you a, a parameter, this is a fixed number. But now in stochastic programming, those numbers are, are unknown. Instead, they just give a probability distrib distribution like we showed on the previous page. Instead of giving you, I give you the demand that is, is 100, I give you the demand that is following this distribution. So this is regarded as stochastic programming. So a key indication we, we use here is that we have multiple guesses of the future rather than just one, because it's now a distribution. You have to have a series of the, if it's discrete, you have several stages. If it's, you have several different classes. If it's continuous, you have a continuous one. But normally we, we use, here we only show you a discrete concept. It's easier to form, formulate. If it's continuous, then it's allowed efforts to model it. So most time we, we follow almost by scenario. So this scenario-based stochastic programming, you are able to capture the uncertainties here. If it's continuous, you can also use the, if it's like perfect normal distribution, then you can use some statistical way to describe this parameter already in your model. So that, that we will introduce further. But here we want to introduce how we use different scenarios to represent those uncertainties or different guesses of the future scenario. So this is a typical type of stochastic programming we use most often in our formulation, in engineering problems. <laughs> so if we represent each future scenario by this S, scenario S, then we have multiple guesses of this scenario, as we say. And then this each of the scenario S will be a particular realization of certain parameters. So it will be the demand of 100, the demand of 200. So for each value of S, it will be one realization of such value, of such S. And you also need to give this probability affiliated with this scenario S. It can be 20% to make the demand 100, and 80% to make the demand 200. So this P will be this probability. So it can be indicated in the percentage value because the probability, when you sum up 
over all the scenarios, the total should be one, right? Because of its probability. You, you want to screen over all the discrete scenarios, and the sum of all the probability will be one. So then, that's the most important concept in stochastic programming. We can't we then have a different set of the variables, right? Because you have the uncertainties in your problem, that uncertainties gives you the parameters to make two several different scenarios. And then the variables, the decision variables, will be the most important thing to know from optimization. We want to make the decision from the optimal solutions. But here the decision variables will be different again. We will divide the decision variables to two kinds. So that's also very straightforward. We call the first kind of the decision variables called here and the now. So here and the now variables are those which must be decided now and they are scenario independent. So they won't care what the demand is 100 or 200. I just make my decisions for now. So it's here and the now. It's, it's like still in the normal problem, I'm making my decisions. It won't be relevant to the scenarios. But the new thing here is we call it wait and see. So this wait and see are another side of the decision variables, which can be decided when the uncertain parameters become revealed or realized. So it's only decided when we know the uncertain parameters <coughs> at the next stage, at the next stage it is realized by the S scenarios. Only at that, that stage, we will decide our weight and state variables. So those are the scenario dependent. Okay. So stochastic programming is more complex than a huge field. You might need a, a semester to learn it, as we say. So we have a famous professor in our business school. Because in business, they, they always deal with uncertainties. You might have, have heard the, the words of Marvin Singh. So his class is also very popular. They focus on stochastic programming in business. So if you are interested, that will be a, another learning resource to, for you if you want to take a class there. But here we just use the very brief one page to give you a definition and then we focus on those S scenarios, right? And these are the key concepts. How do you decide the here and the now and the wait and see, those, those decision variables? All right? So the, with these concepts, I think we, we can learn from one example. This is a classic example. If you search stochastic programming on the Wikipedia, they, they just go through the news boy problem. So so classic that people just use this to, to understand the basic concepts of what are the uncertainties, what are the stochastic programming. So what's, what's the knowledge here? What's the information here? It's like, a newsboy must order X newspapers for tomorrow to make a living by selling the newspapers. So every day they estimate how much I order for, for tomorrow. So this decision variable is X newspapers. But tomorrow's demand is uncertain, right? The demand is a typical uncertain parameter. We always cannot foresee what the demand will be. So tomorrow's demand is uncertain, but luckily follows the distribution. So what's the distribution here for, for the newspaper <coughs> demand? Here it, like, we, we have kind of a data-driven approach because we have the past data from historical setting records. I know the historical demand. So I will use this historical demand then to estimate the future demand. That's a common approach, right? You don't know the future, but you know the history. So we have to rely on the history to forecast for the future. So that's commonly used strategy. But how do we forecast it as all different types of the forecasting methods? So here, it's not the focus here, but then we, we know it's distribution statistical methods we can use to do a lot of forecasting. And we know some uh, fixed parameters. Those are deterministic parameters, the price. Right, because the, the how much the newsboy can buy a newspaper, he knows that, which is $1 to buy. 
And how much he sells it is also known. It's no uncertainty here, it's defined. Of course, it can, can be some decision variable, but in this problem setting, you can decide which is your known parameter, which is your unknown stochastic parameter. So here, he also knows the selling price is 1.4. So seems good business, buy from, uh, buy from the vendor using $1 and sell using $1.4. So if the market is good, the demand is, is big, that can earn a lot, because one newspaper sold, there will be 0.4 profit here. But then what is the right value of x? How, how do you decide your, how, how much, what's the amount to purchase for tomorrow? This is a stochastic programming. Facing the uncertainties in tomorrow's demand, how do you decide the, the quantity to buy? So think about this problem, just understand. If you are this new sport, how do you plan to deal with this? This is not relevant just to sell newspaper, but it's also relevant to many of your personal decisions. We want to make a decision for tomorrow. Do you want to have three job offers and decide which one to go? You're also facing such, such kind of stochastic programming. Which one is uncertain? So you need to have some distribution of your of your future, kind of your, your personal value. So this is a way, how do we see the future uncertainties? Okay, so more information. All right, so we, we say we want to collect the history information. Just like when you make your decision, you always want to know the history information, you want to know the other people's information. Try to get more information to describe the uncertainty. Okay, so we see the smart, but also naive news for I collect the, and analyze the historical data. So we got the historical data, perhaps over uh, previous year, previous months, and then we give you this data and be able to draw the distribution of probability. Right. Again, this is the distribution. So the x-axis will be your value, your parameter. So here is the what the market demand is. It will decide how many how many newspapers you buy. This is the demand of x. Well, the y axis is the probability. So it's also in discrete scenarios. So he analyzed such data with with available available data and see my mean my my uh, historical average. Is at 181. So the news boy is thinking, okay, probably this is a good sign. I should follow the history because it's expected profit. I want to maximize it. Right, so is it a good idea? I just buy the historical mean or the expected value of the amount. Do you, you agree with, with this strategy? No, right. So it's a smart to know I need to collect the data but a bit naive, just following the history, right? If we want to be both smart and uh, making some non-naive strategies, let's look at the, the data we got. Right, so this is the data we provide to you, the historical probability. So here is the purchase is X. We, we don't know how much to purchase. We know the price to buy is one, price to sell is 1.4. We know that historically, the demand will be following this distribution. So this is the data I provide to you. 
if you just look at from the price to the first two column, those are the data we are able to collect from, from the fact, from the, from the historic history. So we know this is a distribution. And then your x is a decision variable, right? If you assume the smart news boy will buy the expected value or the mean value 181 newspapers, let's put the 181 here, right? So if x is 181, what will be my sales? So that's easy to, to be written here, right? Because for each probability, you know a demand. If your purchase amount is smaller than your demand, then you have less supply, you will sell all your products because the demand is higher than what you are selling. So for 100, you can sell 101 service, selling 130, sell them all. Until you have 181. Because you only buy the, the total amount. We should look from the down view. If the market is the demand is larger, if it's the so the market is 260 to 250. If the market is there, then you have 181. Then you can sell your, your own product. That's correct. Sorry about that. You should look from this way. Then you can sell your product. But if the market is not that big, sometimes in a raining day or in different scenarios, you cannot stay. There's no second news. The demand is very low. So if the demand is even lower than 181, then you can only sell the demand value. But for each of the scenario, because you know the price, you are able to calculate the profit. Right? So for each of the sales newspaper, the profit is 0.4. Right? That's uh, from I sell each newspaper 0.4 dollars comes to profit. So I know if I sell in this range 181, the profits are all the same. 0.4 multiplied by 181. So this is a kind of the, the range with the same profit. And then if I, my sales is, is lower than 181, but I still buy 181 newspapers, then how do we calculate the profit? It's still you got from the 170 multiplied by 0.4, you've got the money in. But for those you did not sell, it's a total lose. Right, so you, you have to lose one dollar for those unsold components. So in this case, it will be one seventy multiplied by 0.4 minus this unsold amount here, eleven multiplied by one. Right, so this is your profit. It's still the total income, total revenue minus your total cost. Right, so again, how do you calculate your profit? But the sad thing is when your sales is too low, then your cost is even higher than your profit. So your the, the cost is higher than your, than your revenue. So your profit will be negative. So that's the sad thing about the profit. Right, so we make the news boy is clever to do the historical data and get the E value for the the distribution for demand. But we are even further to get the distribution of the profit because our goal is not just I want to sell as at the demand, I just follow the demand driven. I want to be a profit driven. So I, I calculate my profit and get the distribu distribution of the profit. <laughs> And then this will be give me more information from this profit distribution. If you calculate what is my expected profit, but you're able to calculate that, if you just 
to the data in Excel, like the info has an Excel, and then able to get the expected value of your profit, which is the probability multiplied by each correlated corresponding profit. Then you got the expected profit in 33.63. If you draw your for the draw your profit profit distribution, <coughs> this is the probability of your profit. This is this is just to, to deal more with the data, right? Because you have a higher chance to get the seventy two point four probability. So you can sum all those probabilities together to get the probability to get this profit. So this is, uh, again, the probability distribution for profit. We want to understand how the profit can be. So, so far we have analyzed what is the new spoil by 181, because this is a historical mean of the demand, right? But now we got more information about the, the historical data. And if the new boy knows stochastic programming, how would he solve the problem? Again, they, they list the result here. If, if they got the Excel, you can have your decision variable here to be the X output. If you got any of the software of the programming, you now have your decision variable to be x. Well, following in those probability distribution of your demand. And if they are able to solve this stochastic programming, actually the results, you can try to solve it later. We will show you the code to solve this programming by modeling different demand distribution. Then the news boy will decide to buy 150 newspapers as a solution from the stochastic programming. How is this number of chain? So you need to learn the stochastic programming to get this number if the news boy can do that. But now give, give us a direct sense. If we buy 150 newspapers, what will be the profit? Because now we, we purchase lies, so it's always selling the 150, and here only 101, 30. So we again got a new distribution of the profit and get the mean value for profit. So the mean for profit this time has a huge improvement, improves to 49.5. So this is our contribution of the stochastic programming to give us the increment in the profit. But how to do this, we need to understand later. But with this distribution, we can also envision different, if we have different strategies. If this, with the new small, it's risk averse. He does not want to risk of losing a, a single probability, a, sing, a small amount of probability of losing. Then what's the amount? He should buy. That's also a better type. How do you deal with the with the with the uncertainties? So because this probability distribution is always been we we say uncertainties, but it's also linked to risk, right? Because it's has ten percent of the probability to get those profit, but then it's a risk here. If this person is fully risk averse, it means that we, we won't have a single chance of loss. Even the worst case, the smallest demand, I also want to get a no loss scenario. So what will be the amount I purchase? So in the to maximize the profit, I got 
to buy 150 and to have zero chance of loss. What is the amount we should buy? Again, it's a it's a mathematician to decide the x value. But from the rationale here, as we, we understand the, the distribution, right? So we can see if we buy different amount, we can then test the 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 profit value. We can calculate the profit value here. So if I purchase 140 at this kind of boundary value and the sale 100, I will lose $40 because it's 40 unsealed amount. But in the meanwhile, my sales profit will be 24 multiplied by 100, also 40. So this is kind of no loss point. The profit is zero here. That means even in the worst case scenario, I will not have a loss. So this brings in the concept of first risk averse. I don't want to risk a, a penny, risk a single amount of loss. Or also it gives you the worst case and the best case. Because in the distribution, it's not guaranteed. It's that all different scenarios are possible with certain probability. So in the worst case, with the smallest demand, or in the best case, with largest demand, you should analyze the extreme case scenario as well. So at this time, the, if you purchase 140 about your distribution of profits, you won't have any risk of losing, but then your profit mean will also be lower than the optimal conditions. So you got the distribution and calculate how do we get this? You know how to get this, right? How to get the profit for each one and based on the probability to get the mean value. Again, stand the probability multiplied by the amount to get the mean value. <coughs> so in this case, the expected profit, when you calculate it, it will be 48.65. A bit lower than the optimal case but it's also lower risk. And this is even better expected returns than the naive news form. Right? If you see the initial, if you just follow the history by a huge amount, 181, then the expected profit is 43.63 because this is a huge amount. But from the distribution, it's even higher probability to do to, to the lower demand and the lose. So even this risk averse still gets better return than the naive news boy. So this is a case to show us how important to understand the distribution, the probability distribution. Then you're able to analyze the different scenarios. But so far, we have not even used stochastic programming, which is by trying kind of already touch the basic sense because it's a simple problem. So you can input your x and try to get your, your results. But even a simple problem, you can use the technique, use the distribution to get a lot of insight to improve the, the objective, improve the profits quite a lot. And then we can seriously have a look, how do we really use the stochastic programming, right? If we introduce the concept, again, this will be very useful if we know the different scenarios, know the probability, and then decide here the now variables and the vacancy variables. So in that problem, think about it. What are in this new SPOI problem? What will be your here and now variable? And what will be your wait and see variable? It's quite different problem setting because now your variables need to be either wait here and now, which are the scenario independent, or wait and see, which will depend on the scenarios.
right? If we see this scenario, or the S scenarios, say my decision variables are two sides, right? How much I should purchase this X amount? Is this here and now? Right, because I need to purchase, I need to purchase now, purchase today to get prepared for tomorrow. And the another side of variable was the uh, sales tomorrow. Will this be here in the now or, or wait and see? The sales. This is straightforward because it's a thing happening tomorrow for a market. So this we call it wait and, wait and see variables. Right, so just now we tried, we just have one decision variable because we use historical data to calculate. But if we want to use the stochastic proof, I mean, the, the formal way to form this problem, the formulation, we need to define the two side variables. How much I buy, I purchase for now is, is uh, <coughs> here and now. But how much I can sell for, for tomorrow will be a scenario dependent. So we call it the wait and see for the sales. Right, and then the number of different scenarios, you indicate it by S. And the demand the probability for each of the S, it has a demand correlated to this scenario. Scenario one can be a low demand, scenario two is a mid middle medium demand, scenario three is a medium high demand. Those those it's your when you draw the distribution, it's your X exists as a demand. But your probability for each demand, so it's also probability S, you have those two correlated data set. So here we will decide the variables, how much you buy this purchase is X is a variable, but how much you will sell is, is a scenario dependent one. But you can also write your constraints here, right? Because the constraints will still be, be correlated, correlate, corresponding to the problem. So again, the constraints, as we say, the, the stochastic programming is just for any original problem. Now we introduce more scenarios. And this scenario is not just you fix a scenario and give up one optimization. We want to bring this S, this introduce this scenario to be a variable in the problem. So we put the scenario here as well. So when you write your program, it becomes another, especially in GAMS, it's easier to indicate because it's another index here. For each of the demand, you will then have another index S to indicate the scenario. In a simple case, you can see I have three levels of demand that has this S is one, two, three. It's three stages. But the constraints will still be the real world constraints. It means whatever my sales is, but this, this, this sales cannot be larger than what I purchased. Because I can only sell the amount maximum to, to, to sell O, so that it has to be smaller or equal than the total amount of purchase. And also the sales cannot be larger than the demand. The demand is given as a historical data, but the sales, how much you can sell, is limited, is constrained by the market demand. So sales is smaller or equal than the demand. This is like the Excel process, so we calculate what is my sales. In the previous Excel, I just understand the demand is 200 and the sales is 180, and then I'm, a, I'm able to do that. So let's, let's in the formulation, in numeric way, you just count at the constraint, it will do the logic computing for you. So this will be the scenario dependent formulation. Then what is an objective function? It will also be different because it's also linked to the scenarios. So I want to maximize now the expected profit. Not just like a naive boy use the expected demand. I want to maximize my expected profit. 
And the same setting in profit equals revenue minus cost. Right, so I can indicate what are my total revenues, which are the sales multiplied by the sales price. Right, this is if in the normal deterministic case, this will be the total revenue, right? Just how much I sell for each product and the total amount of products I sell will be my revenue. But now in this case, the sales is depending on the scenarios. So how much I sell has to be linked to the probability of this scenario. So now I got the additional subscript S and then multiplied by its probability S as well. So this becomes my total revenue. But what, how much I spend the cost? Because I say the purchase is a here and the now variable, right? So how much I purchase is not depending on the scenarios. So only the first part is scenario dependent. Well, the, this part is your decision at now. So it's not depending on the future scenario. The purchase is happening now. Although it's a, it's a decision variable, but this purchase is just x, not a x, with subscript s. So this purchase multiplied by the purchase price will be the cost. So in this case, okay, I got my revenue to how much I can sell to be the scenario dependent. Well, how much it costs is uh, deterministic. I just buy those amounts with those price. This is my objective. I want to maximize this total objective. So this is the way we are able to account the uncertainties of the scenarios at the whole problem formulation. Is this clear? Right, so this is a basic one. If you think about your other problem, you can you can go back to any of the uh, deterministic problem you have formulated and say if you want to introduce some of the uh, parameter to be uncertain, to be the Stochastic parameter, how do you add this problem? Just add the additional set of S and then to verify the different set of these variables. Okay, so that's okay. So I hope you also get to know how to program it as well. All right, so now we know the basic concept, but how do we realize it in your final project is maybe very useful. You can consider this. Of course, the simple case is you just give three scenarios, <coughs> and for each scenario, run a deterministic optimization. But it's even more holistic way you can then write the stochastic programming directly. It's not easy, but you can try. Right, so for this question now, but let's still have a look of the newsboy. It's corresponding to this newsboy problem. So you define the site of the S, right, the scenario. In that case, if you remember earlier, we gave you eight different scenarios of demand. So in each demand from one to eight, it has a corresponding demand from the worst case to the best case, from 100 to 255. And for each of the scenario, it's a probability, right? So it also gives you a series of probability. So this is defined as a parameters, but it's with respect to all the scenarios. And then the normal parameters they're giving also, you know the price is just 1 to buy, 1.4 to sell. And here we even put some of the Profit tree hold. Don't have to pay. These are these are more advanced about some of the uh, risk relevance. But if you just want to focus on the basic one, just define the scalars of the price. And here you can directly decide de de define your variables. So of course these are the positive variables of the purchase and the sales. 
So for a basic sample, we don't have to look at this. These are for for the risk analysis. But for basic one, just like we introduced, you just have the purchase is the X to buy now, but you also have the sales, how much you can sell. That's depending on the S. You can prove it that the S can be variable. And you have your objective function here. So that's a defined definition of all the parameter and the variable. Just you can directly use the bracket with the stage. Then the equations also defined. You need to give the two constraints. Sales must be uh, smaller or larger than purchase. And the smaller sales, smaller uh, or equal, uh, smaller or equal than the amount. If just simple example, just these two. The rights are to describe the risk. How was the variation? Was the derivation of the risk? But if only with these two simple sales and constraints, you are able to follow this optimization already. Right. So if we consider. Here, if we just have this sales one, sales two, and the uh, objective as a model. This is a, this is a code right, written to show you how to run different components of the whole code because this has different constraints considered for for different risk analysis. But if you just want to run a basic model, just run the very basic first step. You just consider only sales one, sales two, and objective. It will be give you the result. Remember, the result is one fifty, right? Why? If you try to run this code to see if it's able to solve the new score using linear, it is linear program, right? Very simple, just one LP. Because so, so far we just use the x multiplied by price, so it's still formulated as a linear program. Although it has different uncertainties, it's still regarded as a linear program. So you can use the LP to maximize Z. Just use this part, you will be able to get the first readout. So this is again, so if you want to use other software, it also has a way you can write your stochastic programming. You can just introduce additional scenario. Okay. So the target here, just to let you know, you are able to solve the new score using LP by maximizing Z. And you can display your, your value. Here is a, also useful if you want to show your results. You can go to your LST file, or you can just display your purchase.l, which is a value for how much you purchase, and then show sales.l. If you're interested, you can also then see what the other constraints are to see what, how they consider that the more complex model that considers like the risk or different distribution. It's like the, the problem we showed before, if I'm risk averse, I don't want to lose the uh, $1. How do I formulate the problem? So you can think about the other way to show the more, more added constraints. But the basic one just gives you a sense how, how you can formulate a scenario-dependent stochastic problem. Right? But then if we think about the overall bigger picture of stochastic programming, it's not always this simple, only today and tomorrow. We have all different ways to consider the uncertainties at each stage. So, so far we consider, okay, one here and now stage, because it's always one current stage, but we have tomorrow as a one future stage. Well, we can also have more multiple future stages. Right, so we have tomorrow, but we can also plan. We'll do some like the plant optimization or planning problem. It's not only all long, different time scale planning. You should plan in the next week, 
or, or the continuously every week planning. <coughs> so instead of two stages, you have more and more along the tree. And this uncertainty is often below. Right? If you have a longer time, you want to forecast 10 years later, it's always a lot of uncertainty there. So it's a growing uncertainty. And the future stages are also linked to the current stage. Right? What happened in stage three is also linked to what happened in two. It's like the inventory, like the storage. Your next stage is also linked to your previous stage. So therefore, you no longer can use the Excel to manually analyze the two stage what uncertainties. It's a lot of uncertainty there. So you rely on the computing tools can give you a lot of insights how to do the uh, uncertainty stochastic driven profiling. So those gives you a, a sense that for the scenarios now, can, how can form a tree structure? So it can form a tree with a, with a on the horizon for different time. It can be, it not has to be even late uh, one day, next day, third day. You can define the time scale. You can do a first one day and then one week and one year. It's also possible just to indicate the index to of t. So your t1 can be now, your t2 can be one day later, your t3 can be one week later. So this is how to define your, your t. But also it's kind of a vertical structure for each time, each of the t, you have the scenarios at that time horizon. So this is what we define all the scenarios, the as scenarios will happen at that time. So each node or each stage here will represent the time when the new data becomes available and the new decisions can be made. So from the first day to the second day, I got to the new sales, I will decide the sales amount. And then for, to the next day, once you move to the next node, it's kind of a decision making process at each node, considering the distribution. This is the, the meaning of stochastic programming. You need to make the decision at each of these nodes. And we know each scenario has a particular probability, and then it has a correlated number evaluation of, of real life of the uncertain parameters. So this is the overall structure of stochastic programming. It won't be very easy. It has a lot. The, the typical example of you, you still thinking about the rolling a desk. You can then use stochastic programming to maximize your probability of winning in in a casino. So that's also the most most profitable way to use stochastic programming. You can form kind of based on how you form a strategy at each time, how 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 much you put, you invite to the to the to the current stage. So that's also a typical probability based problem. Right? So this is just a, a part for the stochastic programming. I understand it must be a lot of further questions here, but due to time, this is not the key focus of this, this module. So we give you a basic sense. You just realize it's a lot of uncertainties oriented, and you'll know some basic ones how to incorporate the scenarios into your decision making process. But in the real practice, the sim simplified way of stochastic programming is kind of a pure scenario-based analysis. Right? I mean, you have, most of you have used it already in your project. It's like, uh, I know my uncertainty will be three levels. Therefore, I form a optimization, deterministic optimization with this future scenario. So that's possible. That's, mo that's much easier to solve that because you simplify your problem with this deterministic. We just cut one branch of the tree and solve this problem and regard it as one set of solutions. I think this is a common strategy we will use. And then if you think it's still another possibility, just use another branch to solve it itself. So this way, actually, is, is we, we make the kind of the assumption that there are 
they are like evenly distributed because each scenario is possible. So we calculate under that scenario, optimize under that scenario, right? Because the, the, even the distribution is difficult to get sometimes. Okay. So any questions about the stochastic programming? I think just let you know the basic concepts and know it's useful. So that's uh, what we just introduced here. We'll touch more details. Let's take a 10 minutes break and uh, then we can come back to move to the next slide about the uh, heuristic optimization methods.